just a reminder, you can catch me recording this podcast live on AMP. AMP is a new live radio app that lets you call in and chat with me in person while recording. Get the app on Apple's App Store and make sure you follow me at John Middlecoff to get notified when I go live. What is up, everybody? John Middlecoff, 3 and Out podcast. A lot of football talk coming up. Dakota Prescott and Mike McCarthy, something they need to figure out. Something that happened after last Thursday night game with Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch that I think is kind of symbolic of some of the things that are going wrong for other teams. And then something today that Aaron Rodgers said to McAfee that I wanted to touch on, as well as a quick thought on this Dan Lanning, Deion Sanders, videos coming out from the programs, have a couple quick thoughts and how it pertains to this big matchup this week with USC. But first, subscribe to the podcast, wherever you may listen, three and out, go subscribe right now, Apple, Spotify, we got you covered. As well as if you're watching this on YouTube, hammer that like button, subscribe to the page, leave a comment below in the description. You want a three and out flex fit hat? They fit great. Can't recommend them enough. Go to thevolume.com, thevolume.com, search the merch. And yeah, before we get into football, I need to tell you about something. Do you want to get out of your house? Do you want to go do something fun? Do you want to go to a Taylor Swift concert whenever she goes touring again? Do you want to go see your favorite comedian? you want to go see Deion Sanders? Well, here's what I need you to do. I need you to grab that little thing called the smartphone. Trust me, we all got them. And I need you to type in your apps, Game Time. They happen to be the official ticketing app of this podcast, three and out, game time, official ticketing app of this pod. Sign up. Go to their maps. Go search any event you want to go to. They have interactive maps on every event. You can figure out where you're sitting, the price points, and type in the promo code John. That's just my name, J-O-H-N, promo code John, anything you want to go to. Football games, basketball games, World Series games, concerts, comedy shows, game time app, promo code John, save $20. Keep hammering that promo code, people. I wanted to start. I I talked to uh, briefly with Coward after on Sunday night. And we hit on the Cowboy situation. Clearly, the the cool part about the NFL is the stats speak for themselves. Every year you have teams that made the uh, playoffs previously, missed the playoffs, and teams that missed the playoffs make the playoffs. And every year we all pick teams like this team's going to suck. This team's going to be awful. And then they're actually kind of competitive. And we think, oh, this team might be a fringe playoff team. And then they draft fourth overall. Uh, There's a ton of parity in this league, right? Every team has the same amount of money and same amount of draft picks. You just get to choose how you allocate it. And typically what changes for a lot of teams is who's your head coach and who's your quarterback. But even then, sometimes people get injured, things change. All of a sudden, we all thought Arizona was going to suck. Caleb Williams is going to refuse to go there. And now, listen, I don't think they're headed toward nine wins, but they're clearly pretty damn competitive. It's like, oh, maybe the Broncos will be decent this year. No, they blow. So you find out things even earlier in the season where you're like, wrong on that one, right on that one, and you know relatively quick. And one thing with the Dallas Cowboys, the NFL's hard. There are a lot of cliches that come out of locker rooms, cliches that come out of post games, cliches that you hear at the beginning of the week when you're watching your favorite team's coaches press conference. Some of it is true. Like it's very difficult to win in the league. As a fan, I would have been like, give me a break. This team's one and 11. You know, you have eight wins. You should win this game. But I've seen it. And I'll never forget going into David Cully's office. He was the wide receiver coach when I was with the Eagles. He ended up obviously famously getting the Texans job one and done nice guy though, you know, good position coach, probably not a head coach clearly, but I, I I made a comment like my first year in the NFL. I'm like, God, these guys suck. He's like, what'd you say? He's like, don't ever say that, man. He's like, they have big houses and drive nice cars too. And it's true In, in the, this is not college football where Oregon has dramatically a much better roster than Colorado, even in the NFL where teams have better rosters, all those guys are getting paid. And some of them are getting paid a lot of money. It's difficult to win. So to me, Dallas, like I maybe overvalued them a little bit, thinking they'd win, they had like 15 win upside. There's there's still a 12, 13 win team. I I feel strongly about that. But one thing came to light the other day is Mike McCarthy. And I, I saw them play live in Mike McCarthy and Aaron Rodgers' young career uh several times. And it was a sight to be seen. 
You had Clay Matthews with the hair flying around, and you had Aaron just slinging it to guys like Driver, Jones, and Jordy Nelson in the peak of his young powers. And he was really, really special. And you can look up his red zone numbers. They're some of the best in NFL history. Now, most great quarterbacks are good in the red zone. Just like most solid quarterbacks, like a Dak Prescott, is going to throw most of his touchdowns in the red zone. But what made Aaron Rodgers really special for a long period of time, and he was even good when he was winning the MVPs a couple years ago, was he could really ad-lib. It's really one of his greatest strengths. When you think about the greatest quarterbacks of all time, at least in my life, Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, like they weren't ad-lib guys. They couldn't really move. They could ad-lib at the line of scrimmage. They could ad-lib a hot read to their wide receiver with a look or a hand movement, but they couldn't move. They couldn't just all of a sudden juke a defender, scramble around, and make some laser to the back corner of the end zone. That wasn't their deal. Well, Aaron, at least in my lifetime, you could maybe throw Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen now in that mix, but of a guy with a long career is clearly one of the great ad-libbers and freelancers we've ever seen. When a play breaks down, he can not only keep it alive, he then can make a play that, only a handful of guys in NFL history have the capability of making, which is a big reason his red zone performances are historically great because in the construct of the offense, he can dominate when the play called and it just works, right? You run a slant, an out, whatever, and it's his go-to read and the guy's open, he's going to hit it like a layup. But when those plays are covered, he then can move and make something happen. And his physical capabilities with his arm strength, his intelligence, and I'm talking about Green Bay Aaron and then the stretch he had, you know, year two and year three with LaFleur. It's just all-time great stuff. Just because you play, you pay a player a lot of money, whether you give a baseball player, an NFL player, $100, $200 million in the NBA, max contract, does not mean they're a max player. It's just the market value. Typically, front office or the coach feels we can't, upgrade if we don't pay this guy a lot of times you're backed into a corner maybe you have a higher opinion of the player than other people whatever he's just as good as you're gonna do so you pay him whatever the market determines that you owe him right and you know in the nfl you start franchising it actually is you know more you have more options on your salary cap if you give him a more lucrative long-term deal because the way you're able to manipulate it on the books so just because Dak Prescott is making all this money doesn't mean he's that level of player. Dak Prescott has been the same guy now for about five years. And there's nothing wrong with it. He's a really, really solid player. Great guy, team captain. If you can't have one of the top seven, eight guys, if you do a good job team building, which the Cowboys do, you're going to win a lot of games with that guy playing. But here's the problem. Is McCarthy kind of, I, I don't want to say, you know, became a high-end NFL coach when he had peak Aaron Rodgers. Right. And now he's got Dak Prescott, who is nowhere near the version that put Mike McCarthy kind of on the map and made him a guy that Jerry Jones would immediately offer out of a year out of the NFL. And now that McCarthy has taken over play calling, you watched him the other day in Arizona, like Dak Prescott's not going to pull plays out of his ass consistently like Aaron Rodgers. There is going to be a lot of pressure on McCarthy, the schemer, the chess player to get him some easy looks. And there isn't really any excuses. Tony Pollard, a very unique, talented, skilled running back, can catch the ball, obviously can run the ball between and outside the tackles. You got C.D. Lamb, a guy that can basically run every route, right? But it's easy, and they did this a couple times, like, let's just run the fade. And listen, I'm not anti the fade, but I like scheming a guy to get an easier look than that. And Brandon Cooks, who's a smaller player, but with his speed, you can utilize it, you know, to get him in some open space. I.e., the Cardinals, when they ran Hollywood Brown late in that game for basically the game clinching touchdown, just ran him across the field. And he eventually got open. Dobbs kept the play alive, ad libbed a little bit. So I think there's going to be a lot of pressure. Everyone's going to constantly be crit- critical of Dak. It's the nature of playing that position and making a lot of money. He is what he is, right? It's on the, the coaching staff, really, and the play caller to get him easier looks. Like, he's not going to make Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, 
Aaron Rodgers in his prime place. He never really has, and especially now, like his arms, okay, his mobility's solid, but like the guy Dak Prescott has been the last couple of years is the guy you're getting right now. So there is pressure. Like he's kind of established where he's at, 9, 10, 11, somewhere like that as an NFL quarterback, which is good. Why the Cowboys probably want to keep the guy, but he's going to be a little dependent on the guy moving the chess pieces around as the play call. And that to me, watching that game against Arizona, most good teams in the NFL, the Eagles, the 49ers, and Miami could all go 14 and three or 15 and two. One of their losses is going to be stunning. They easily could lose a game at some point in the season, especially late in the season, overlooking opponent to a team where they're a 14 point favorite. Pe- teams in the NFL get upset all the time. I don't want to even make that big a deal over the one game, but specifically in the red zone, it's pretty clear like, Dak's going to need some help. And to me, there's a lot of pressure right now if I'm Jerry looking at Mike because who do I got to beat in the conference? Well, I know Kyle can move chess pieces around, right? Even the Eagles, they just have so much talent that me and you could figure out a way to score some touchdowns when we got in the red zone with that offensive line, with that quarterback sneak, with A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, Goddard. It's just, it's hard not to. But the Cowboys, listen, this might not be the 93 Cowboys on offense, but they do have a lot of talent and they should be scoring points. And it's going to be a lot of pressure on them if they're going to want to compete with the Niners and the Eagles to get it done in the red zone. And to me, that doesn't start with Dak because we've established what he is. It starts with a head coach. We're back with another week of football and DraftKings Sportsbook is keeping us in on the NFL action with great offers every single game day. New customers can bet $5 and get $200 instantly in bonus bets. Throw five down on any of this week's epic matchups to walk away an instant winner. And DraftKings isn't stopping there. All customers can take advantage of two new offers every game day this September. Football's more fun when you're in on the action. So download the app now and sign up with the code JOHN, J-O-H-N. New customers can bet $5 to get $200 instantly in bonus bets. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official betting partner of the NFL, with code John J O H N. The crown is yours. Uh, speaking of Aaron Rodgers, I watched some clips of him today with uh, with Pat McAfee, where he goes on every week. He continues to go on as he's in Southern California, listening to dolphins have sex, trying to heal his uh, his Achilles, and seemed like he was in pretty good spirits which it has to suck watching your team get dominated by Belichick while you're sitting at home. And it's a shitty situation. Like I said yesterday on my Zach Wilson thoughts, no one signs up for this. Like this, this is something you can't control. You can control who the backup is, but you can't control a guy tearing his Achilles, especially someone who your entire season depended on. But we're here. And Aaron clearly watched the game and kind of, I would say, Took some shots. I didn't know if he was going to take shots at like the coaching staff or even specifically Zach, but he kind of just took shots at the entire offense. He's like, we kind of got to be a little more mature than we were because one clip that went viral on Sunday was the backup running back screaming at the running back coach. And there was another visual, don't totally blame him, Garrett Wilson kind of being frustrated with Zach Wilson. And clearly any time, and this happened last year with the Jets, your your offense is just incapable of operating. Like, it's beyond anemic. It doesn't move. It's just, it's unwatchable. Like, the Bears and the Jets, this version of their offenses are unwatchable. People get mad, especially skill guys. For the most part, you know, you see blowups every once in a while with linemen. A lot of their blowups typically, at least in my experience, happen behind closed doors. It can get really ugly in the office, in the meeting rooms, in the locker room, but th- th- they tend to do it. Now we've seen it. Remember uh, the two Washington guys, the two D linemen fought. I was like, I wouldn't want to be in the middle of those guys. I think we have a long history of skill guys kind of losing their cool, right? It's just, it's just it kind of is what it is. And those guys aren't happy because they know nothing's going to change and nothing's going to change fast. But on Thursday, after the Giants uh, got their butts kicked by the 49ers, By the end or middle of the next day, John Lynch 
and Kyle Shanahan had been extended. And a big reason they had been extended is because in the NFL, like they had just traded Trey Lance, what, three weeks, three and a half weeks, less than 30 days ago. A guy that is easily the worst draft pick. I'm not the player. His career's not over. I'm just talking about the compensation, what it took to get him. The guy didn't even last till week one, season three. It doesn't get any worse than that. Even Jamarcus Russell and Zach Wilson, they've lasted year three on their team. Trey Lance did not. Doesn't get any worse. But guess what? You're not paid to draft in the NFL. You're paid to win. And the 49ers are 15-1 and one in their last 16 games. That includes the playoffs, the loss to the Eagles. They, the last two years, are 26-11 and 11 with four playoff victories. They're currently, obviously, 3-0 and 0 right now. Looks like they're headed toward 14-15 wins. But their operation is just very stable. And like the Jets, like, shit goes wrong all the time. Last year, they had Trey Lance breaks his ankle in the second game. Later in the season, when they're rolling, Jimmy Garoppolo breaks his foot. Constant adversity. Yet players, hell, players even in the offseason ask for trades, Debo Samuel. And it never gets that weird. So basically, Jed York clearly is extending them and the 49ers' ownership as parents because they win. That's first and foremost. That is what you were paid to do. Not to draft, not to land guys in free agency, not to develop coaches, win fucking games on Sunday, Monday, and Thursday. That's all that matters in the NFL. It band-aids everything. Sean Payton... That Russell Wilson could be worse than last year. If they were two and one, they'd be singing his praises. But he's 0-3 and they're giving up 70 points. It feels like a disaster. And I think sometimes as coaching staffs, and it obviously once you're there longer, you have a much better rapport with your guys. But for example, now, Robert Sala has been there long enough with these guys. Most of the guys, especially the young players, he drafted them all or was part of drafting them. And he's in charge of hiring the offensive coordinator. And shit's going to go wrong. It's the NFL. Hell, McCarthy has been part of seasons where I remember when Rodgers broke his collarbone. I think it happened on Monday night. And remember that season, they ended up figuring out a way to get to the playoffs as a wild card. So part of being a good coach is handling some rough waters. Things are not always going to go smoothly. Things are going to be difficult. Injuries are going to happen. And I think sometimes in the NFL, like it's one thing to win. Like I said, most important thing. It's also another thing to win and just be pretty normal and pretty stable. The Chiefs are a good example this year. Their first game, Travis Kelsey, at one moment, they probably thought he had torn his ACL. His knee was all messed up. He was standing on the sideline. They got their star defensive player up in the stands. It's like, God, this isn't easy. And they lose the game at home to the Detroit Lions, to the Detroit freaking Lions, who are honestly pretty good. I think are I feel pretty good about them winning that division. Uh, even with the Packers, you know, being feisty and they're going to have a lot of guys returning for injury. But listen, like, it's tough. It's never easy. Even the Detroit Lions, they draft Jamison Williams, comes back off the ACL, and then he starts making parlays and can't stay out of trouble, gets suspended for six games. And you see some of these teams, like the Jets, like Aaron Rodgers tears Achilles. That sucks. A lot of players have gotten hurt in the history of the league. Happens all the time. Do Does your team just unravel? Do your players start fighting other coaches? Because that's a reflection of your coach. And that's when shit starts hitting the fan and things get weird. That's when owners get antsy. Like the Bears. Listen, Justin Fields sucks. That's not your fault. You didn't draft him. But your defensive coordinator is forced to resign. You haven't won a game in almost a calendar year. Like players are starting to get antsy. Things get weird. And you just have to wonder, like, listen, I was told this this offseason about Jonathan Gannon. And listen. A lot of people listening, if you're a Cardinal fan, I don't know if we have that many Cardinal fans listening, but no, I was pretty critical. Just thought it was kind of crazy that the guy got hired. Um, you know, he bought a $10 million house. I, now listen, I'm pro getting a $10 million house, but first time head coach is like, just crazy world we live in. And I had guys with the Eagles tell me, listen, John, he might not be Belichick or Vic Fangio when it comes to just dominance of defensive scheme, but he's an impressive guy. And he is a fantastic just kind of leader. And some of those videos this year went viral, right? Of him doing the pew, pew, pews to Rondale Moore, of him having the video inside with the players about fire in their gut. And everyone was shitting on him. Well, that's what Twitter does. Everyone just is negative. It's just an area where the angry congregate and the media lives most of their days. 
But Jonathan Gannon, you give him credit, like clearly his team feels very motivated and is trying really hard. And he doesn't have that many guys that feel like would be huge core pieces of contending teams. But you watch the Jets, it's like, guys are kind of unraveling off one injury. So you really were just, obviously your success this year of going deep in the playoffs was going to be because of Aaron Rodgers. But I just remove him. You're just a 5-6 win team because that's where it kind of feels like you're headed. Now I'm pretty sure you're playing the Chiefs this week at home, Sunday night football. I'm sure you know who's going to be in the house. A lot of eyeballs on that bad boy. You put Taylor Swift in a suite at an NFL game. See those numbers? Like 10 extra million people watch. So this could get ugly. This could get ugly really fast. And owners, to me, get very, very uneasy. It's one thing if I like you and I'm rooting for you, and I think clearly they like Sala, they like Joe Douglas, but, like, so shit hits the fan. Like, it's no guarantee if we draft Caleb Williams, he won't get hurt. Well, so your backup comes in, we're just automatically going to suck? And that's that's what I wonder. And you're seeing it with the Bears. You're seeing it with the Jets. Obviously, Sean Payton's getting a little time because he's just only coached three games. But it can't go much worse, much, you know, more quickly than it has. Right. 70 to 20. I, I still can't get over that. I really can't. 70 points? 70 points. And they had 70 points, like seven minutes remaining in the game. That's insane. I've said over and over. I said it yesterday. I'm going to say it all week. I'd rather lose like 50 to nothing. They lost by 50 points. I'd rather lose 50 to nothing. If you lose, if you give up 70 points, that's basically three more touchdowns from 50 to nothing. That is so many touchdowns. Is that even possible? How is that possible? How did anyone ever show up to the meeting the next day? How could you walk into the office? I used to be petrified in college and the pros after a loss, how angry everyone was, how tense everyone was. These are like game-winning field goal losses or a late interception loss. This is These are close games. Can't even imagine walking in. I was at the Fresno State game uh, a couple weeks back, and I was hanging out with a guy that played in the NFL for six, seven years. He was kind of like a journeyman tight end, and he played all over the place. And, and he said that, he played for the Patriots for a couple of years in their heyday. It was like Randy Moss. They never lost. And he said it was every meeting was so intense because the coaching staff didn't miss. They never missed a uh, missed assignment. So if you fucked up, look, not even talking like a drop or a miss block, like a misstep running, just angling your body the wrong way for half a yard that might screw up the coverage to cheat. He said, you got undressed. The standard there, he's like, was stupid high. Everywhere else I would go, I was terrified to go into these meetings because I expected to get that. Yet most places this guy went, and he went to some successful places, he's like, it wasn't nearly like that. Not that he didn't get yelled at when you had a missed assignment, but the standard was nowhere near what it was. What is Sean Payton doing? And it, I, I followed the stories of, you know, some of the local media, especially some former Denver Broncos, are kind of being critical because he's being short with the reporters. And he's a classic, like, good to the local reporters, bad, or bad to the local reporters, good to the national reporters. I don't really care about any of that uh, because ultimately none of that means anything if you're losing 70 to 20. Like, I, I don't – no one, Adam Schefter, Colin, no one can justify giving up 70 points in 2023 in the National Football League. It, it's – no one can defend that. Not not even your biggest, you know, fanboy. It, it's impossible. And the Jets are at the point like, how do you defend? Keep running out Zach Wilson, right? I, the Bears. What else are they supposed to do? I would run fields into the ground. So no one has any excuse. But the Zach Will, Trevor Simeon, like much is going to change there. And I don't know, man. Crazy league. One more thing I wanted to hit on, because this story, some of the. Uh, the discourse on this has just been kind of laughable. I, I talked about it briefly yesterday. And then this morning when I woke up, about 50 people had forwarded me. And it was on my uh, Twitter account and Instagram account as well. The video that the Oregon Ducks put out about basically the entire week of the Colorado week. And the thing I wanted to focus on was the pregame. I have no problem. And I've said this over and over. The NFL and college football don't really parallel each other 
beside the football game on Saturday or Sunday. And even there are some different rules in the games and the hash marks are different. But the money all comes from the games. But Monday and for college, Sunday through Friday is completely different. In college football, there are elements that an NFL coach never has to deal with. In the NFL, Monday and Tuesday are 100% just game plan. That's all you do. You just play chess against the other team on film. You try to figure out your game plan. And then you completely, you know, implement at practice what's going to work, what's not going to work, and you continue to change, adapt, add, or subtract throughout the week. Now, while you do that in college, you game plan, practice, add, subtract throughout the week, you also spend a lot of time talking to recruits on the phone, texting, interacting. You also, with your players, have to do some stuff academically. And you can only spend so much time with them. So your days are much different. Recruiting is an area in the NFL that's irrelevant. Andy Reid this week is not recruiting anybody. Pete Carroll, Kyle Shanahan, Belichick, their only focus is first, second, third down offense and defense and special teams against their opponent. That's the only thing that matters. Where Dion is hosting, I saw the 2025 number one recruit. You're constantly marketing. And Dion's one of the great marketers of all time. Nick Saban, underrated marketer. Pete Carroll was a great marketer. Honestly, I, I'm not a great marketer. It's one thing in this profession I think I could be better at. I'm a good salesman. I can talk. I can sell the shit out of anybody. But marketing's not really my strong point. Dion can fucking market. He, he's been great at it since I was a little kid. He's just, he's a lead ass. I mean, it doesn't get any better. And he's clearly a pretty good salesman too once he gets in the room. But any of this stuff that the coaches said, I, I it didn't trigger me. I thought the reaction was moronic. Dan Lanning, Deion Sanders, you can say whatever you want. But some of the clips of the Colorado players talking shit to Oregon on the field, it was like, yeah, I think this is a little much. You guys are acting like you're Deion Sanders or like this is the you in 1998 or you play for Urban Meyer and the Florida team in 07. Like, come on, guys, let's pump the brakes. Talking about we're going to kick your ass, staring them down. I don't know about that. That That's where I, I, I think sometimes Dion, who his bravado, his confidence is earned. He's earned it for 30 years. All he's ever done is be successful, dominate in or on and off the field in football, in the marketing sphere of selling himself, in ads, of just being the ultimate cash cow. But beside like Travis Hunter and Shador, I think most guys on Colorado should just kind of ease in when they're playing opponents like Oregon, like USC. And to, to do like that, I was thinking about this morning. If the Oregon players had been on video saying, I'm going to beat the shit out of you, just talking a bunch of shit, and then got mollywopped, I can't even imagine the outcry of all the former players. And the other thing that's bothered me about the former players who are all pro Dion, which I am too, right? I, I just think that like his team now, we got to pump the brakes. Like we got to come back to earth, not in terms of recruiting, but like you don't get to act like you're the equals of Oregon because clearly you're not. You have to prove that. Like once we get to the field, you have to prove your worth. Dion's proving his worth as a marketer, as a coach, right? I think sometimes these guys and these players all on TV who played at a high level, who played at all these colleges, if other players on a team that was not their equal was talking shit about all the guys on TV, they would all want to fucking fight them right there. It would be a brawl. So I one thing it, Colorado is going to have to be careful in this group is it feels like they've taken on Dion's bravado, but they're not playing Nebraska anymore. They're playing some of these squads that are the real deal. They got NFL dudes ever. Like Oregon, if I played for Oregon and, and I was walking out and I saw all these Colorado guys talking all this shit when we're at home, clearly, how many guys on Colorado do you think Oregon would not just want, but would have offered coming out of high school beside Travis Hunter? I bet it's a pretty, pretty small list. Well, guess what? The players at Oregon know that. So they don't view Colorado as the same, just like USC this weekend, will not view them as equals. So this notion that like, I feel like Colorado, because of Dion, 
is almost being held to this other standard, like the players. I didn't see any criticism beside from former NFL Oregon players. All these other NFL players are always critical of all this stuff. Like, you got to earn it. You can't just run your mouth. And then Colorado does it and not a peep. I, I just, I don't get it. I, I really don't. I mean, it's, it's kind of baffling to me, though not surprising because no one wants to really piss off Dion. But I would imagine Dion tells these guys, let's, let's rate it back in a little bit. Not like me in the social media videos, but on the field. Like, I, I wouldn't be calling fucking saying something to Caleb Williams pregame, right? It's probably not a good idea because you, you're not, they're equals, even though you're, you've had some success. Now, it is amazing. And this is the power of Dion, and this is why his confidence is so high. They had more people watching that game, Colorado, Oregon, a blowout than Notre Dame and Ohio State. And you could argue the two biggest brands in college football, definitely two of the top four, are Ohio State and Notre Dame. Two brands rate. NBC has literally signed an exclusive deal to have Notre Dame games because they rate. Ohio State printed cash for Fox forever on Big Doom kickoff just because they get seven, eight million people. In Colorado, and this shows how polarizing Dion is, right? Because of everything he's saying, he just causes everyone to have an opinion, right? In my business, I don't care if you hate me or love me, just listen, right? Just have an opinion. Once you get apathetic and don't care, I'd be in trouble. Right, Dion knows as a recruiter, like you got to move the needle. He doesn't care if like the media or former players were pissed off, but it does matter when his players are crossing the line. And I thought it wasn't a good idea, and clearly it was not because Oregon uh, made him pay. Something magical happens when the third quarter ends and the fourth quarter begins. The energy changes. The fourth quarter is where games are won, where champions are made, and in business, it's where sales teams become legends. That's why HubSpot built Sales Hub to give sales reps the deal-making tools they need to win in Q4 and close the year strong. Sales Hub Prospecting Workplaces organizes your schedule, goals, and to-do lists in one place to save your team precious fourth quarter time. Smart sequences help sales reps close deals faster than ever. And with an easy-to-use deal management tool, Reps can find, track, and close deals all in one place. Plus, AI forecasting helps you accurately predict future success, which means less hoping for deals and more crushing targets. Put your sales team on the fast track to winning Q4 with Sales Hub. Learn more at hubspot.com slash sales. 